On today's show, we talk to a mom whose 15-year-old son is stealing from family members and she doesn't know what to do. We talk to a new dad who has adopted kids who were adopted embryos and he wants to know when to tell them. And we talk about counseling, what it is, what it's not, and how to find a therapist. Stay tuned. Hey, what up, what up? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show. Glad you're here. Taking your calls on, on your relationships, on your mental health, on parenting, on whatever's going on in your life and in your world. Whew. So normally this is when I make a joke or I have some uh, funny things or some serious things or I don't know, talk about something positive and um, there's no, no secret here. You can hear it in my voice. It's been a hard, uh, hard few days. And um, by the time you get this, uh, we end up shooting these shows a couple of weeks uh, ahead of, of themselves, I guess. And so um, this show, you'll get it in a few weeks. And um, but this weekend, man, we lost a lost a light, lost a, a buddy named Mark Rogers in a small little town called Abilene, Texas. Um, man, one of the most extraordinary men I've ever met. Um, in fact, most most people outside my wife and a few friends don't know this. I, it was the first podcast I ever did in my life. I, I refused to be on the internet, and he had a show with his buddy um, called Simply Human. And he's the first guy that talked to me about, man, wellness is a much bigger picture than, you know, trying to do a marathon or trying to eat keto or whatever. And one of the funniest guys I've ever, ever met. Man, I was jealous of him in so many ways. Super good looking guy. He married one of my, uh, an old friend of mine. um, And together they had three remarkable little girls. And he died suddenly this weekend in a one in a million car wreck, senseless heartbreaking and you know we talk a lot you guys hear me answer other people's calls all the time on this show always talking to other people about their challenges and there's just a level of disingenuousness is that the right word i I gotta be honest right and um this is one of those days that i'm hurting and one of those days that works hard one of those days that um, it's hard to get out of bed and one of those days that i hug my kids extra tight and um you lose somebody like that there's just there's just a few people on the planet that are, were born flashlights for other people to follow he was the president of uh, big brothers big sisters in his community ran a nonprofit in his free time with his wife and um was just the dad of the century man and so to my brother mark we miss you and all those folks the, the thousands of young kids that you've touched through young life through big brothers and big sisters just by being the guy that was funny and silly and brought joy into other pl- into dark places man um to that community it's going to be mourning your loss for years and years and years and the rogers family the barker family those folks who are just going to be in a lot of hurt i want you know that we're thinking about you and praying for you and um i'm a human too man and i'm 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 struggling to get through this one this one was extra 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 hard um, not because we were super close. We didn't talk to each other. Man, we, we didn't talk that often. But he had an impact on me that was pretty significant, and he um, impacted a lot of people on a daily basis. So um, be thinking about you guys. And if you're listening to this, just so you know, we're people too, man. And um, we're, we, we struggle like everybody, and we reach out to our friends, and I've got a great group of friends who we've been communicating and talking. And... Um, even shared some heartbreak with my old man. My old man and, and Mark were close too. So, so those hard things, man. And you get up and you go to work, and then you make sure you surround yourself with people who are going to walk alongside you during hard times. And um, and then we will continue to put good into the world and do what we can to make meaning on the back end of this. But um, just wanted just to be honest and share with everybody. You can hear it in my voice and uh, my normal like beep doop beep doo is just not there today, man. And, and I, I could fake it and lie to everybody, and that's just that's not it's not the the show we're going to do and that's not the person i am so um we're glad that you're here thank you for letting me talk about one of the best men i've ever met mark rogers and um let's let's go straight to the phones today let's talk to crystal in palmer alaska crystal what's going on hey it's good how are you doing i'm good how are you i'm good fantastic so what's going on how can i help yeah, so I have a 15-year-old son who often steals from us and his younger siblings, and I'm just looking for advice on how to stop that behavior. All right, so tell me what that looks like. 
Um, it's kind of been a long-term thing, but okay. the latest thing that happened is that um, my younger children's tithing money went missing. It was over $100. He denied it, so I backed him up, and then I was cleaning his room a couple weeks later, and I found the empty envelope. Mm. Yeah. Yikes. So what, right. what happened next? So um, my husband worked out of town, so I was kind of just going to let him deal with it. Um, but I I basically ended up telling him I had found, the, found it. Mm-hmm. Um, he denied taking the bigger chunk of money and said at first that he just took the daughter, my daughter's money, which was $10. But then I showed him that I had the envelope. So he didn't take any personal responsibility. And then I don't know if it was the right thing to do or not, but we basically made them pay, pay back him. He paid them back double so that they could pay their tithing. And then. So he had to come up with 200 just, bucks. Yeah. Where did he yeah. get the other hundred bucks? He works. Okay. So he has money. The reason we kind of doubled it was because we've had him pay us back for things that he's taken before. And then it, I kind of feel like in his mind, it's like he bought it. Ah, okay. Versus like, I took something that I shouldn't have taken, if so that makes sense. You said this has been happening for a long time. When did he start stealing from you guys? Um, I mean, I mean, I'm sure he didn't do it when he was a toddler, but I basically remember this happening his entire life. We're always finding our things in his room. Mm. He always takes things from us and takes them apart and he doesn't see anything wrong with that hmm. so what <laughs> hmm. so the question i always ask in these situations is based on one one sentiment is that behavior is a language so okay. if with with that in mind mm-hmm. if you, you know your son better than anybody what is your son trying to tell the people in his in his ecosystem in his world what's he trying to tell him um things don't matter he wants desperately to be seen there is tension among parents and he's trying to say hey meet look over here the rules don't matter and there's almost a pathology he doesn't understand consequences um yeah what is there's chaos in the home and that he's making sense of chaos by grabbing what he can like what is what is his behavior what, what is he trying to tell people um the only thing i can think of is that my husband works out of town two weeks on two weeks off okay how, how long has he done that for 13 years okay so for most of his life yeah and so i i mean he I don't know if it's just that he always acts like he's an adult, even though he's not an adult. Like he, he views himself as like our equal. Um, Do y'all treat him like he's your equal? Or let me, let me say it this way. Do you, do you use him as a friend when your husband's gone? Do you use him as quote unquote, the man of the house, the, um, the guy who picks up the slack when dad's gone. Has he been put into a, a grown-up role? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I'll have him do more of the physical jobs that need to be done. Sure. But, because uh, I do need the help. Yeah, le- less th- less those. Is there a sense that he has... And this isn't necessarily a bad thing, so don't hear me blaming. I'm just trying to get some information. Right, right. But is, yeah. is he viewed in that role. All right, you're the man of the house while I'm gone. I need you to really step up. Hey, there's somebody knocking on the door. I need you to go take care of that. I need you to take care of your brothers and sisters. You're the only guy around here, so you got to deal with the, you know, I don't know, the snowmobile. I don't think so. Okay. So where, did, no, where does he get so. this? Where does he get that sense from? Um, um, I'm really not sure. Okay. He just kind of always had the the personality of of that. I mean, and he's always been talked back. Um, I'm not sure. So I'm sure that's not any help. <laughs> well, no, um, it's, it's good <laughs> info. So um, what what have you tried over the years to curb his, his stealing? Um, we've tried talking to him. We've tried making him, you know, buy the thing that he destroyed and give it back to the person. Um, 
we've t- tried taking away privileges. Um, but with the privileges, it's always like, oh, well, that doesn't matter. That doesn't that doesn't affect me. I'll mm-hmm. just I'll just do something else. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but I I mean the only the other thing I can think of is like I'm often I don't know I'm just often stressed out because I've got three other kids. Sure. Um, and he causes a lot of stress. Yeah. <laughs> the stuff that he's doing. So I don't know if it's just maybe the stress and the he knows that we're unhappy with him and so he's just doing more of it. Um, I'm going to ask you something crazy. When's the last time okay. just you and him went out and I haven't you looked him in the eye and said, "Hey, tell me about what's going on in your world. You got any girlfriends? All right, how's school going?" <laughs> I don't. I haven't gone out with him much one on one. He did go out with his dad, mm-hmm. um, and they went camping, and he was just like, he was great. Yeah. He didn't have any issues. There was no problems. He wasn't disrespectful. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> what you've done, restitution, grounding him, um, making him pay double, right? The next move mm-hmm. is like physical, right? It just escalates in those ways. Sometimes kids respond to that. Often they don't, right? And so yeah, I, yeah. I may be way out to lunch here. Two things. One, there's something you're not telling me, and that's okay. There is some sort of tension in that home that he is absorbing. And whether that's okay. 13 years of two weeks on, two weeks off, or of mm-hmm. just the chaos of having two. Is he got two younger siblings? Three. Three young, so there's four in the house? Yeah. Okay. Whether that is he is desperate for money because um, he's caught up in things he shouldn't be caught up in, whatever that looks like, there is a disconnect between two things. One, his value and role, his okay. participation in this home. Okay. He has had to take it upon himself to be the big bad dude. And the big bad dude okay. can do whatever the big bad dude wants to do, including take stuff. I got money. Double it. I don't care. Yeah. And or I'm just going to take this from you. Okay. So, right. He sounds like somebody right. who's a political, uh, the other political party one. They're like, yeah, we'll show you. Right. He just sounds like that. <laughs> right. And yeah. um, the other thing is, is he is not see himself as a participating member of this family unit. Right. Okay. So there's not a common set of values that everybody's buying into here. And I, here's the thing. I'm not getting into the, he's got, he's never felt the pain of what happens when you are one of the four pillars holding this house up and you just, you opt out and the house falls over, right? He doesn't, that's, right. A, that's he's disconnected from that. He doesn't feel the pain of not participating, right? So he just kind of can uh, do whatever he wants to. My guess is I can't imagine how loud and exhausting, especially when it gets dark for seasons. I can't imagine anything other than if the 15-year-old's quiet, things are okay. Because the other three are setting yeah. things on fire, right? And <laughs> then yeah. there becomes this feedback loop. And he's not even going to think this intentionally. Of, I am just floating out here. I am Pluto. I may not even be a planet anymore. And I'm going to circle back and whether... It's negative attention, positive attention, loud attention. I'm bigger mm-hmm. than the rules. I'm bigger than this family system. I got three more years till I'm out of here. I'm stuck right. out here. And no one even cares anyway, which is a 15-year-old saying, hey, somebody look at me. Mm-hmm. Right? And I'm not saying to let him get yeah. away with anything. In fact, the opposite. Here's where I would start if I'm you. And I want to start with this. I'll start with this. This is me being vulnerable. As a kid, I was a awful thief. I stole baseball cards. I st- dude, I was such a punk. I didn't break into, you know, I wasn't like breaking into stores or anything. Dude, I was just a jerk. I was a jerk. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I was a bad guy. Right? Um, right. Now, we could deconstruct my whole life. That's not the point. But I want to tell you is this. <laughs> he can, and I think he will, grow up. I think he can't. Okay. Man, you can talk about, I didn't get mad at my students very often. But I grew to where I had no holds barred for, for theft because it was so divisive in communities. And mm-hmm. I had to learn that and had some people be very candid with me, right? 
and really I had to feel the weight of what happens when I become part of the reason a, a, a community or a value system falls apart. So here's what I want you to do. Number one, I want you to find some child care and I want you to take okay. him out on a date, just y'all two. Okay. And I want you to probably write down some questions and I want you to tell him, this is going to be weird, but we're going on a date. Just me and you. He's going to be like, oh, mom. And you tell him, nope, there is no discussion, no nothing. And I want you to start the date by telling him, I haven't told you this in a long time, and I'm sorry. I absolutely am crazy about you, and I love you. Okay. And you are the big brother in this house, and I'm so glad you're the big brother in this house. I'm so glad you're my first son. I'm so grateful for you. And I haven't asked you about your girlfriends. I haven't asked you about sports. I haven't asked you about schools or robots or what painting, whatever he's into. Mm -hmm. And I want you to force him into a conversation about himself over a meal. And okay. then here's part two. And hey, some of that is going to be awkward because this is new and he's going to think this is a setup. <laughs> and I, you, may, you can tell him, hey, listen, I can outweigh you. I dream of silent moments. And so I'll sit here silently for this whole dinner and just stare at your beautiful, <laughs> beautiful face. Um, okay. But tell me what's going on. And you can tell him this. If you don't want to tell me about who you're interested in, I'm going to tell you about how I fell in love with your dad and how we used to make out on dates. I mean, you can get him to talk, right? <laughs> right. Um, the second part is I want you to tell him that you are going to create a value system for the home and it needs everybody's okay. input. So one of the things we have at our house that we got the kids involved with, me and my wife did, is we sat down and got everybody on the table and we talked about not what the rules are of the Deloney house. We don't hit, we don't steal. No, we did something a little bit deeper than that. We talked about who the Deloney's are. Okay. We are people who say yes. We are people of hospitality. We always have people over at our house. People trying to work on their marriage, people who are just our friends, people who are goofy or silly or loud and vote different than us. We have a, a cadre of wackadoos staying at our house, right? We had a group of people tent out in our front yard last night. It was awesome. And so we are always have people over. We are people of adventure. And then we get into we are people who treat others with respect and dignity. And okay. so when my daughter or my son hit somebody, takes something, we always circle back to, hey, here's the family values that we all opted into. And you mm -hmm. chose to opt out. And man, I love having you here. And I hate that you opted out. Here's the consequences of that, right? You are a part of this system and we need you here. And I see you, my son, okay. I see you. I want you to start touching him regularly and tell him, I'm gonna touch your face every day and I'm gonna look in your eyes because you're beautiful and this is gonna be so weird. And I okay. want you to do it. And it's gonna help both of you and he's mm -hmm. gonna freak out. I also want you to tell him, there is no more theft in our home. Okay. There is nothing more divisive than stealing in this house. And you will feel significant consequences when that happens. Okay. I don't know okay. what that looks like in your house, but it right. has to be very strong. Not that you're coming in as the warrior mom, but it's because he opted out of this set of values that you all agreed on. Right. Okay. In our home or this, if you can do it when your husband's home too, even better, even awesome. Yeah. And I know this sounds counterintuitive and there's going to be people who get in the, the internets and the comments and say, you know what he needs? He needs a spanking. He needs to have all this. And we're taking it. This kid needs to feel like he's got value. He okay. needs to look like he is seen. He needs to, mm -hmm. to understand that mom loves, loves, loves him. His brothers and sisters need him. That his dad loves, loves, loves him. And that a value in this home is you do not steal. You do not take from those, from anybody, ever. And the response will be swift. It may be worth, I'll tell you this, my dad, my granddad was one of the nicest men who ever lived. Kind, nice man. And my dad took me down to my granddad's house one day and I had to go sit in the garage in Houston and talk to my granddad about lying. I remember that conversation to this day. Because my granddad looked at me, an old, wise man, and said, Delonies don't lie. We tell the truth. 
And I remember that conversation to this day. And it may mean that you got to get somebody at your local, from your local school or local community where you work who has been to jail, has had run-ins with the law, someone who can sit down with your son, not in the scare them straight, not that kind of way, but who can say, hey, man, as a society, we've all said we don't steal. The more you opt into this, man, the consequences are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And don't go to jail, man. You got money. I don't think the theft is because he needs it for drugs. I don't think the theft is because he needs it and he's embarrassed. I think he's walking through life because the rules don't apply to him. And I think he's walking through life like he's bigger than the rules. It's cool. I'll just take it. It's fine. And he's got to get plugged into a system that counts on him. And what I'll tell you, Crystal, is that changed me. That changed me. Those hard conversations changed me. Those value plugins changed me. And a group of people that held me accountable, really uncomfortably so, changed me. Thank you so, so much for that call. Hey, listen, um, I, I get this email a lot, so I want to take a minute here. Um, I get an email about how to find a therapist. I get an email a lot. Um, what makes a good therapist? I've been in therapy and it's stupid, it's dumb. Here's a good email from Allison. She writes, I've been seeing a therapist since March of 2020, I don't know if she's making an impact on my life as of today. I feel like I'm paying for a chat with a girlfriend. Yikes. What makes a good therapist? Are there specific things that should be going on during a typical session? All right, so I'm going to back that out, and here's a couple of things here. Number one, well, let's just answer that directly. A good therapist is not your friend. They are not your friend. They are a teacher. They are someone who is walking alongside you, right? So a therapist is not your friend. They should not be, be condescending or unrelatable. And they should rarely, rarely give you advice. That's not their job. Their job is to hold a mirror up. Their job is to say, you say this, but here's how you're living. You want to be free, but here's how you spend your money. You want to have great relationships. Here's how you choose to fill in the blank, right? Their job is to listen deeply, to reflect to teach you how to connect the dots across relationships and events and consequences. A therapist is not a mystic or a healer or a predictor of the future, right? As I said earlier, a therapist is not your friend. They're not your buddy. They're not your future romantic partner. They're not someone to try to win over. They're someone to be honest with, right? Their job is to teach you how to be a good friend or how to be a good romantic partner. I started seeing a counselor recently uh, here in Nashville, and within 45 minutes, man, I thought we were going to get in a fist fight. He said some things like, hey, here's what you've told me about X, Y, and Z. And I looked at him and thought, you better not say that again. And then he smiled and said, ah, what is that? Is that sadness or anger? And I was like, ooh, you got me. Well played. Well played, homie. And we had a good exchange. He's not my friend, right? He's just simply reflecting back to me things that I was saying that I hadn't put the dots together on. And I put together dots for a living, right? A good therapist, a good therapist will challenge you. Therapy should be uncomfortable if it's done right. A counselor should not always be neutral. They should tell you the truth when you are wrong. That's been a big thing in the counseling profession. You know, never take sides. I think that's nonsense, man. I really side with Terry Real on this one. Sometimes you gotta take sides. Sometimes you gotta look at someone and say, This behavior is childish. This behavior is hurting the people you love. This behavior is not getting you what you said you wanted to get, right? It's their job to point you in a new direction you haven't considered or challenges you're avoiding, right? And as I've said throughout this little rant here, a a good therapist reflects you to yourself. They hold up a mirror. They show you how people experience you in the world, right? So here's a good example. Session two, session three, the counselor might find themselves getting really bored. A good counselor will lean in and be bold and say, the people in your world call you boring? Do they experience you as Eeyore, as kind of slow, um, as like, uh, do they often check their watch or their phone when you're talking? What they are teaching you is here is how the world experiences you right? When the therapist feels bored, it might sound harsh, right? But when they reflect their experience and shares the truth gently, it's one of the most loving things they can do for you because we live in a culture where people don't tell the truth or when they do, they weaponize it and they don't say, hey, I'm struggling to stay connected with you. Is this how other people experience you? 
Have people told you that before? No, in, in the real world, they say, God, you're bored, dude. I don't want to hang out. Or they lie to you as, as to why they don't invite you to things, right? If you truly want to develop skills of connection, you got to be able to accept this honest feedback, right? So that's what a therapist does. And so, no, if you've been, Allison, if you've been in therapy since March 2020 and your therapist isn't challenging you to work towards goals that you've established, if they aren't challenging you to see the world differently, to develop new skills, to teach you new ways of interacting with yourself and other people, yeah, man, it's time for you to move on. If you leave counseling and think, ah, I'm just chatting with my friend, man, you are wasting $150, right? Or whatever it costs, right? $5,000 or $50 or whatever it happens to be. And therapist, don't do that. Don't just take people's money. There's The backlogs are too big. There's too many people who need help. If people are doing well and you're just at the chatting stage, let them go. Let them go. If you need to find a therapist, ask people you trust, check with your insurance for an in-network provider. Think about what kind of therapist you're going to need, right? You're going to be more comfortable meeting with a man or a woman. Do you want online telehealth appointments or in-person? I'm super biased about in-person, if at all possible, right? Does it, do they have to have spiritual beliefs that you share or worldview beliefs? Does it need to be somebody who specializes in grief or marriage or parenting or aging trauma or whatever it is? Think about what you're looking for. Ask people you trust. Check with your insurance provider. Check online um, or look into local resources. And there's everything from graduate school, university programs. I was an intern, right? That's And I saw people for free. Um, I was at a family counseling that, that had sliding scale for folks who couldn't afford high dollar stuff. And then there's cash pay, right? If you are blessed and you've got the money and you can pay for cash pay, go get it, whatever you need to do. And then ask your potential therapist a few questions. Do you accept my insurance? Can you help me with my particular challenges? Will we commit to this relationship for a few months or for longer? And here's a big one. Don't give up after the first session. It should be awkward and weird, right? I left my first session the other day fired up and I can't wait to go back. Because I know that challenge is good. It's like going to the gym and getting a personal trainer and that first session makes you sore the next day and you're like, I'm never working out again. No, you're supposed to, right? If you haven't been to the gym in a while, it's supposed to be uncomfortable. It's supposed to be, right? So if you are struggling and you need somebody, please be bold and brave and go talk to somebody, right? Go a couple of sessions before you bail out. And for God's sakes, man, prepare to be challenged. It's good. It's good to be challenged. It's hard, but it's good. All right, let's go to James in Chicago. James, what's up? How can I help? Hey, Dr. John. How's it going? Good, brother. How are you? I'm doing great. Good. What's up, man? How can I help? So my question is, my wife and I, we have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, a three-year-old girl, a one-year-old boy, and they're both embryo adoptions. My wife was able to carry them, but they really don't have anything to do with us. So my question is... Hey, hold on, hold on. Hold on. They have everything to do with y'all. Okay, I, I, I do get that. I just don't know. I mean, I guess the proper way to say it. I just want to make sure I got my point across. Okay, okay. yeah, you got it. You got it. You, they're not your... Is it... Biological. Is it your sperm or is it, or is it no. fertilized eggs? Ne- neither of us. Okay, gotcha. Okay. So you adopted well, fertilized is, embryos, was, and then you had you got two kids. There you go. Yes, she carried them, but but we just got embryos from the hospital. Okay, very cool. So my question is, we we have every intention of telling them, but we need to know age appropriate, maybe some unique ways. I've heard of maybe possible books that help with that, like kids' books, even. Sure. So, but we need help along the way of when and how and. And not to make it seem awkward, you know? Yeah, you betcha, man. Thank you so much for having that heart. Good for you. Um, how You just told me the ages and I missed them. Three and one, is that right? That is correct. Okay. So, with your three-year-old, and it happens way quicker than you think it's going to, man. Because it, I was super caught off guard. They will begin exploring their own bodies and whatever words you guys use to decide to call body parts and things, right? One of those important goals for every parent is to not make any part of a human body feel weird, right? Or feel okay. shameful or feel, right? And so I'm, I'm backing way up. I'm going to get to your question here. Um, for my grad students, we used to make <laughs> all the grad students had to say in unison, right? 
you have to say vagina out loud. You have to say penis. out. If you can't say that, you can't be a therapist, right? If you can't say body parts, <laughs> you can't be a therapist. If you can't say body parts, you can't be a parent. That should be a rule, right? And yeah. we've got generations of kids who were ashamed of their body parts, right? It led to all kinds of stuff. So that's number one. Your three-year-old is probably already there asking questions. Um, they will become four and five and six during this time. They're going to ask natural questions. Where do babies come from? Where do I come from? That's when you can, in an age-appropriate way, with all of the joy and miracle and excitement you guys can muster, there are eggs inside of the girl body, right? And then they have sperm in the boy body, and the, they meet together, and then they make a baby. And we didn't even, we weren't able to have those in our body, so we got some from somebody else. And so we had them put it in our body, right? So it's very, very natural. They will not carry the baggage that you guys feel. They'll just go, huh, oh, right? And so think about this. When you were a kid, well, I don't know how old, how old are you? Uh, 39. 30, okay, sweet. So you're 39. So we're in the same boat here. Trying to explain to us when we were five what an iPad is would have sounded like the Jetsons, <laughs> right? My kids just, it was there when they were born. And the, that idea that they're carrying around this half, like three centimeter piece of metal and glass that they can talk to people on the other side of the world and see their faces is not a, they don't carry that. Almost every time I look at an iPad, I'm like, this is insane, right? So yeah. they won't carry that same baggage. As they get older, right? Seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, they will ask deeper questions. And that's when you can be more open about, hey, here's how mommy's body worked. Here's how daddy's body worked. Here's some of the medical challenges we have. And here's what was so neat. An, like another family where it's willing to share you with us. And you're our baby. And you can show them where babies come from and the pregnancy pictures and all of the, that miraculous stuff. And it will be like a, whoa. As your kid gets to be 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, that's when they'll start asking questions about, hey, do you think my biological parents exist, right? Are they out there? Do you have, re do you have contact with them? Do you know who they are? Um, we have like names and information, but they're, as of right now, as we heard, they didn't want contacted or reached out to. So. Okay. So what I expect, what we've seen over the last five to 10 years, James, and what I expect is to accelerate is with 23andMe, with um the internet basically man there's br there's very few quote, quote unquote closed adoptions anymore kids want to know yeah. where they're from and they want to know who they're from and now that we've got genetic stuff for medical things they want to know um what might i expect down the road medically speak there's all kinds of things there right and so um i would expect that and by the time you get to those conversations hopefully you will have a, a openness in your house a and a you, you, where your kids will come to you for things they know you will never shy away from a hard conversation whether it's a body part conversation or a sex conversation or a racism or politics conversation whatever that looks like you are always going to be a safe space that honors them when they ask questions right and then never makes them feel dumb then when you get to that 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and they can understand science a little bit more when they can start to understand heritage where am i from legacy those kind of things you can honestly and openly discuss that with them and if you don't feel comfortable there are professional counselors who that's their job is to have those type of conversations and bridge those gaps as you mentioned there is some great children's literature out there you can just look at amazon um, to find some great children's books uh, uh, you know that will walk through these magical it gives kids a picture in their mind so they can see it and go wow that's me right and they it, it will make them feel a part of something when they see somebody like them in a book, right? That's why like inclusion in, in children's literature is so important when a kid can see themselves in a book. It just feel like that kid looks like me. They have hair like me. They have skin like me. They have a face like me in very much like your situation, right? Um, they got to take a ride and put into mommy's tummy and mommy had a big, big tummy. And then I was born just like, right? And they become part of a narrative they can see and experience. Here's the other thing. I don't ever, ever, ever want you to ever, ever, ever say anything other than I'm your dad 
and your mom's your mom. Is that cool? Yeah. I don't ever, ever, ever want you to feel anything less than their mom or their dad because you are. Have you carried around stuff in your heart for a while about that? Yeah, it's it's yeah, kind of difficult. And and here we're we're trying to have another kid, however God seems deems necessary, if He does. And one thing we're going through, we, we try to get back in the same program. And they told us it's not likely. Mm-hmm. And we've heard stories of people saying, you know, after their wife's carried a couple, sometimes things work out and you have your own. And so, yeah, we're we're I think we're still kind of dealing with that in yeah. some areas. You know, we had an incident a couple months ago where. She kind of had some things that she thought might have been a pregnancy, but it ended up being something different. So we were kind of getting excited and, yeah. you know, dealing with the whole, it didn't happen again type thing. So I don't know. It's, yeah. it's still some more in there. James, are, are you all staying connected through this? Yeah. Yeah, we we do pretty well. Okay, here's what I want to tell you. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking directly into the camera here. I know you can't see me, but um, I've been down this road. And... Me and my wife experienced the pain of infertility, the challenges with those things very, very differently. And we both thought we were pretty close. And then come to find out, whoa, we were experiencing these things way, way differently. And if you just went through yet another loss, and I'm not talking about loss of a pregnancy, I'm talking about loss of hope, right? That begins to weigh on your heart, that weighs on her heart, and it just weighs differently. So I want you guys to make sure you are hyper, hyper proactive about your relationship, how you communicate to one another, how you love one another, and how you give each other space to grieve, whatever that looks like for each other. This can be a something that binds you guys together, but it can be devastating for a couple. Okay? And I'm just talking, I'm just, I've been there. Okay? Yeah. And... Most importantly, if you want to set your that three-year-old beautiful little baby and that one-year-old little baby, those miracles, which is what they are, they are what they can what they have done was it's just unfathomable. Oh yeah, for sure. Listen, those are your kids, right? And the best thing you can do for those kids is be intertwined and connected to the with at the soul level with their mom. Okay. Yeah. That's number one. Number two is never think of yourself any less. They're not a step away from you. They are every bit of part of your soul, brother. And you did a brave, brave, bold thing by going through the adoption process, by going through the embryo adoption process, which comes which comes with risk and it comes with hope. And there's nothing more intoxicating in this in the this this season than hope. And there's nothing more devastating than hope, right? You are their dad. They are your kids. And they will be forever. And your wife is a mom. She carried him to term. She's got two little babies. And they are your kids. You're a dad, brother. Let that sink in. Put all that shame, all that, hey, yeah, but but there is no buts. You're a dad, my man. And start today creating a home where your kids' feelings count, where their questions count, where they see you and your wife having hard conversations together. They see y'all hugging together. They see y'all um, dealing with hard things together. Model those conversations. And man, you're going to create kids that when the hard conversations come, and they will, it's part of it, they're not going to go run into the hills. They're not going to go run into the internet. They're going to go running to the two safest people they know in the world. And that's James. That's you and your wife. I love your heart, brother. Thank you so, so much, man. All right, so as we wrap up today's show, um, man, I don't know if I can make it through this song today. I'm just going to cut to it. This is a, a, a magic song that I hold close to my heart and has been for a long, long time. From Edie Brickell, the New Bohemians, from years ago, for off the album Shooting Rubber Band at the Stars. It's called Circle. It says, me, I'm a part of a circle of friends. And we, we notice you don't come around. And me, I think it all depends on you touching ground with us. But I quit. I give up. Nothing's good enough for anybody else, it seems. And I quit. I give up. Nothing's good enough for anybody else. 
and being alone is the best way to be. When I'm by myself, it's the best way to be. When I'm all alone, it's the best way to be. And when I'm by myself, nobody else can say goodbye. Everything is temporary anyway when the streets are wet and the colors slip into the sky, but I don't know why that means you and I are. That means you and I quit, I give up. And me, I'm a part of your circle of friends and we notice you don't come around. If you got friends in your life, hug them close. Everything is temporary. Hug them close. This is the Dr. John Deloney Show.